Here's Barbara, and I'll let her introduce herself for those of you who haven't met her yet. Thanks, Barbara. Well, thanks, Jan. Uh, so nice to to have the support of this simple practice team, and always lovely to be invited to Ask Biller. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Barbara Griswold. I am a private practice coach. I help therapists out there to build their dream practices. And I'm also the author of Navigating the Insurance Maze, the therapist's complete guide to working with insurance and whether you should, uh, which is now in its ninth edition. Um, I have been out there for 33 years practicing as a licensed marriage and family therapist on way too many insurance plans, I like to say. Um, and now I uh, have closed my therapy practice and I provide training and ther um, to therapists and groups nationwide on insurance, documentation, practice building, you name it, um, all that stuff you never learned in graduate school. So uh, that whole business side of your practice and my goal is to help you feel as confident about your businesses as you do about therapy since, you know, we got no training, most of us, in running a business or in documentation and all that stuff. Um, but that's also essential to keeping our doors open for our lovely clients. So um, if I can help you with that, please contact me. All right. So let's go through our slides here. First, I want to talk about what I call the landing page. The you're going to find links to all the articles. Instead of giving you a bunch of different places to go and article links, I've put them all on one page. So all you need to know and need to remember uh, after you leave here today is or for watching this, if you are interested in an article that I've talked about, a resource that I talked about, and a, a bunch of freebies that I'm giving out, it's all going to be on one landing page, I call it. And that is an Take a minute to write this down, theinsurancemaze.com forward slash super bill. That's for today's webinar. Uh, and for those of you watching the recording, you can go there and everything I'm going to talk about and refer to, I'm going to refer to it like a million times today. You just insert your email to unlock the page with all the resources. Okay, let's get to some of those pre-submitted questions and answers. What exactly is an out-of-network therapist? Uh, and what do I have to do to become one? Well, this is a fun uh, one because people get confused. There's a lot of steps to become a network therapist. Are there steps that you have to do to take an out-of-network therapist? And what is exactly is it when we're talking about an out-of-network therapist? Basically, to become an out-of-network therapist, you just have to breathe. You just have to have a pulse. You don't have to take any steps. Anyone who hasn't signed a contract with a particular insurance plan is automatically considered an out-of-network therapist. So um, you doing nothing makes you out-of-network therapist with that plan. If you signed a contract to become a network provider for that plan, then you're a network therapist or a panel provider, different words for the same thing. Do all clients have coverage to see an out-of-network therapist? Let's look. The answer is no. So let's look at the next slide. Most insurance companies have different types of plans within them. A lot of people don't realize this. So um, let's talk about some of the popular ones and whether they have out-of-network uh, provision. So a client could have an HMO plan, which stands for Health Maintenance Organization. Or they could have an EPO plan. You don't need to know what these all stand for, but I threw it in here. Exclusive provider organization, less common. Um, this, these type of plans only cover network providers. So a client cannot choose to see an out-of-network therapist like yourself, let's say, and be covered by the health plan. They certainly can go there, but they have to pay out of pocket. So HMO, just here in your mind, which is more common than an EPO, this kind of here in your mind, uh, they're only going to probably cover me if I am a network provider for that health plan. But the client might have on their card little thing that says PPO plan or POS plan, less common. So PPO is a preferred provider organization. POS is point of service plan. What's different about these plans, and these are very popular, the PPO is that they will cover network providers and out of network providers. Just when the client goes out of network, they typically pay 
more, right? So they incentivize the client to pay to see a network provider, but they still will get some level of coverage to see an out of network. So this means it's important to you to learn these differences and we're going to talk about using how to use them later. But if a client comes to you and says, are you covered? If they have a PPO plan, you may they may be able to get some level of reimbursement to see you. And your knowledge of that can help you keep that client. So that's why it's important to know these things. Now, I started out this slide by saying, you could have a Cigna client who has a Cigna HMO. You could have a Cigna client that has a PPO. So you can't go by based on the insurance plan. It's different plans within an insurance company. How does insurance billing usually work for out-of-network providers? Well, I'm going to talk about how it usually works, and then later we're going to talk about some options. But let's talk about how it usually works. Usually the client pays you in full for whatever your, the fee is that you've worked out, ideally at the time of the session. I really strongly discourage you from billing clients later, uh, like at the end of the month for all the month sessions. Um, we work in a very volatile industry. People get mad at us. Clients have different uh, financial fortunes. They might have lost their job by the time that you, your bill hits them. I really, really strongly, it's also a pain in the neck, I think, for us to do billing. Uh, it's We don't need to spend that time. So I strongly encourage people to get paid in each session. Um, if they have out-of-network coverage, you give them a statement, or also called a super bill, reflecting the payment that they made. And usually the client then turns that super bill in to their health plan to seek reimbursement if they have out-of-network coverage again. Now, often they must attach it to a form from their employer or from their health plan. And then the client hopefully is partially or fully reimbursed for the session. That's a lot of steps and a lot of our clients, I'm sure you experience this, you know, you give them a, they don't even ask for a super bill. They don't know they can do this. And therapists don't sometimes tell them, hey, have you sought, re sought reimbursement? So they don't know. It's really important to us, to me at least, that we educate our clients. Hey, you might be able to get reimbursed for these sessions. Um, so we need to know enough to be able to, to teach them. And sometimes you give them a super bill and they never submit it. Um, so that's something I try to encourage clients and try to help them with, which is something we'll talk about later. But the pros of this approach, there's no financial risk for you. There's no billing hassles. You're just handing them a super bill once a month or once, whatever frequency. You, the downside is you may lose some clients who are unable to pay in full up front, right? Clients must figure out where and how to submit these bills and it may lead to treatment dropout. But I'm not probably not telling you anything you don't already know. I've heard of fellow clinicians providing courtesy billing or concierge billing. Can you explain what that means and how it works? Sure. There's different, obviously, language. I'm going to call <laughs> the two most common options courtesy billing light and full courtesy billing. Um, in courtesy billing light, the client is paying you in full, just like we talked about, and but the only difference is you are playing mailman. You're submitting the super bill for them to the plan. Um, and then the plan is going to reimburse the client as always. The only difference is you are handling the super bill submission for them to the plan. You can do that electronically. You can do it um, by mail. There's lots of ways to do it, but you're just kind of helping them a little bit to get that reimbursement. Now there's no financial risk for you. So that's a pro. And this may attract new clients if you put that on your website. Hey, I will take care of the insurance billing for you. You know, um, this is also going to help them get reimbursed, which may help them stay in treatment longer, right? Downside, obviously, there's some level of hassle. You have to look into where to send the super bills. You have to make, you know, maybe check their coverage. Well, you don't have to check their coverage. Send, you have to do a little bit of either electronic setup or setup. Um, make sure you're sending them to the right place. But usually it's pretty minimal once you've set that up. Now here's the other kind, which is called, well, I'm going to call full courtesy billing. 
and I don't recommend this, and I'll explain a little bit why. This is where the client pays you only their out-of-network coinsurance. I'll back up and explain this. And then you bill insurance for the rest. And then the plan reimburses you. You, It's called accepting assignment. Let's go back and see what this means. Um, let's say my client, I look into their health insurance and they have 50% coverage when they see an out-of-network um, therapist. Well, instead of saying, hey, client, you have to pay my $200 fee up front and then you go bill your insurance, I could say, hey, I know you have 50% uh, coverage. Why don't you just pay me $100 I'll bill your insurance for the other hundred and they'll pay me. Okay. That's called accepting assignment and a co-insurance. Let's just define that. That's the a percentage that is often used for out of network. Whenever a client has a percentage of your fee that they're responsible for paying, that's called a co-insurance. When they have a flat fee, like a $20 every time, that's called a co-payment just so you get that. Okay, what are some uh, pros about this approach? Obviously, this is great for clients, right? It's maximum help, may make sessions affordable to clients who couldn't otherwise afford to see you. Um, the downside is obviously it's the most work for you. Um, the plan also could pay the client instead of you. Very often, I don't want to say very often, but sometimes the insurance, they see you're out of network, they are used to cutting the check to the client. So they don't um, pay you. So then you're chasing your client down for money uh, and that could be uncomfortable. And it's not always easy to figure out how much to collect from the client because you don't always know how much the insurance plan is going to pay. They may say, hey, $200, that's too much. We don't want to reimburse 50% of $200. We are going to cut, cut, give you a cap of let's say 150 for your services and we're only going to reimburse 50% of that. So it's hard to figure out sometimes how much to collect from the client. Now, another reason I don't recommend it is that your reimbursement is just not guaranteed. Something that's happening out there now uh, in the last few years um, that's raised a lot, a lot of lawsuits against insurance plans is that um, they're playing around with out of network reimbursement. They're having this, um, these insurance plans are hiring external um, organizations, one called Data Eyesight, one called Zealous, to come in and reprice their out of network, how much they'll reimburse out of network therapists. So maybe one day they're saying, yeah, we think $200 is fine and we will reimburse 50% of that. And the next day, suddenly you're like, oh, no, they only are going to allow $100 and we'll only reimburse $50. So there's, it's very dicey out there right now. There's a lot of lawsuits going on. I have a whole article about this. And that's the first thing that's going to be, not the first thing, but that's going to be on our landing page. There's an article. It's called the Data Eyesight article. And that's on the landing page. If you want to find out more, if you're doing this full courtesy billing or thinking about it, you definitely want to read this article. So go to theinsurancemaze.com forward slash superbill on that landing page and read the data I cite article. Okay. Well, what should be on my super bill? Let's talk about that. I'm going to show you just a little snippet of one sample super bill here. Um, so we've got Thelma therapist here and her address and her phone number and all that good stuff and the date of the invoice over there to the right. As you go down the page, uh, I can't animate this, unfortunately, um, but the client's name, a date of birth should be on there somewhere, probably a uh, diagnosis code, essential, essential. Um, and then you'll see that I put in different columns and you don't have to, but I think it's really important uh, to set, to have all these things on there. You got the date of the service. You want the place of service code. Now, many therapists don't have this on their Super Bowl bill, but it's really important now that we're into telehealth big time. Um, place of service tells the insurance plan, where did this take place? Was it in person? That would be an 11. Uh, was it telehealth? 
the place of service code for telehealth um, recently split about a year or two ago. Um, it used to be 02 for all telehealth. Now it, it's formally 10 when the client is at their home and it's a 02 when they're anywhere else. So check with your insurance plans and double check, but that is the formal place of service code. Um, so obviously for this, when I saw Dorothy Gale here, she was at her home for the telehealth session. Now, how else do they know it was? The next you'll see there was a CPT code. That's the five digit code that tells them what kind of session this was. And the 90837 is a 60 minute therapy session, which goes from 53 minutes and above. But next to that, you'll see modifier. This is may be required by insurance plans for your telehealth sessions. Um, don't forget to put this on there. Some, some uh, plans don't require this, but um, some do. The modifier for a telehealth session is usually 95 or GT. Insurance plans will usually accept both. Uh, the only one I know, Regents, as I understand, does not accept 95 and insists on GT. So either one of that's at this time again. I don't know when you're watching this, but uh, um, and then I have a service description. It's not necessary, but it's another way to tell them that it was a video session. So you'll see there's three ways here I'm telling them it was a video session. So I'm sure that this is processed as a video session. Um, you put your charges, how much did the client pay at the session, and um, you know current balance. Also on here is going to be your your license number, your EIN, uh, or your tax ID number, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and your national provider identifier, um, which again, uh, which is free to get and everyone should have. So these are some very important things that need to be on a super bill. Um, we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Let's talk frequency. How often do you need to give somebody a super bill? You know, there's nothing mandatory about how frequent. The more you can give it to the client, obviously, if they turn them in, the frequent more the cash flow is going to be for them. But um, it's really up to you and the client. I would agree on that ahead of time. I do suggest that you get a free employer ID number, which is called an EIN. So you don't have to put your social security number on your super bills. Uh, again, that can lead to identity theft. Um, also, you know, you've got some angry clients out there, um, or you have partners of your great clients, um, who you just, you don't want anyone out there to have your social security number who might be able to do something to harm you with it. So that's just something to think about. It's free. And the link to get that EIN is on our landing page at the insurancemaze.com forward slash super bill. For telehealth, what address do you use? We're flying through a lot of big issues, but basically use your office address. If you still have a physical office address, um, you can put that on there. Even if you're sitting at home in your pajamas doing your telehealth, it's just what what is your formal official office address? Put that on the super bill. If you've given up your office, I tell you, don't put a PO box only on the super bill it could get rejected by an insurance plan. They usually want to know a service address. Um, and then some people use their home address, but I'd say that that, you know, sets you up again for potential concerns about privacy. So it may be unwise to use your, your home address. So some therapists are using their colleagues' office address. Some are getting a virtual office address, which you can look into, such as Regis, ipostal1.com. I'm not saying that these are um, perfect solutions. We are in an imperfect place here where insurance plans like to see a physical location and um, yet they know we're doing all telehealth. So it's kind of odd. Uh, do list each date of service on a separate line. Um, and for groups, usually you're going to give the rendering provider's name and the NPI plus the group's name and the group tax ID and the group NPI. So try to put information about the rendering provider also. Now my freebie number one, I'm giving away two freebies today because you attended 
this is a sample super bill. For those of you who don't have a really good super bill uh, through your electronic health record, or you don't like the one that is uh, <laughs> given to you, um, you can download this and see a sample super bill. Um, and you can make it so it accommodates your practice. You can also join my mailing list. And again, you go to theinsurancemaze.com forward slash superbill, enter your email address, and you will automatically be taken to the, to the page with all the resources. An insurance plan asked me to send a W-9 before they would reimburse my out-of-network client. Is this common? Will this make me a member of the network? I get this question all the time. Great question. Yes, it's common, uh, particularly if the insurance plan has no, does not have you basically in their computer. For them to, to enter you and your tax ID into the computer, even though they're paying your client, I know it makes me sound weird, but they need to have you attest, yes, that's my tax ID number. So yes, it won't make you a network member. Don't worry about that. Go ahead and fill that out and send it to them. And you might want to have one hanging around because you probably are going to have to send it more than once to different health plans. You don't, shouldn't have to send it more than once to the same health plan. That once they're, you're in their computer, they're usually fine. And the link to the W-9 is also on our landing page at theinsurancemaze.com forward slash super bill. So can you be audited or have your records requested if you're out of network and your clients get reimbursed? Can your treatment be reviewed? Well, I'd like to tell you no, but the answer is yes. Audits and clinical reviews do happen for out-of-network clinicians, though I will admit they are rare. They are usually something that is not that frequent. Um, usually they will only do it if something unusual is going on in your billing, like they see that you're seeing clients multiple times weekly or a, a client multiple times weekly, or you're doing ongoing extended sessions, or here's another one. Um, if you are um, a supervisor billing for a bunch of associates and you're billing under your um, NPI or tax ID, and they're seeing like, you know, uh, 15 sessions come through under your name in one day, <laughs> uh, they're really like, what? Um, so if there's anything kind of unusual that that's going on, so any kind of what they'd call incident to billing or supervisory billing, you have kind of a, a more, a higher audit uh, request there or audit risk. And yes, just so you know, plans can refuse to pay if your documentation isn't good. And I would say, yes, it's completely unfair. It's not like when you, you didn't, enroll with this health plan and get to see what the documentation um, requirements were. Um, but they still can say, hey, you didn't convince us that these sessions were medically needed or that you needed to see this person twice a week or whatever. So they certainly can, can go after your documentation. Now, just a quick quick overview of a three hour webinar that I have on uh, documentation, but what is it that they're usually wanting to see? They want to see your therapy start and stop times this is a big thing that they look for. Um, and we're not talking about the scheduled start and stop times that is put in every week. If you have an 11 to 12 o'clock session with people and they look for your documentation and they say, Oh, every week she said that she, saw them from 11 to 12, that's not believable. What you need to record in each session note is the therapy start and stop time. So 11.01 to 11.56 one week, next week 11.02 to 11.54, whatever, and make sure that it hits the threshold of 53 minutes if you're going to report a 908.37. Uh, so be sure, it's one of the biggest things they audit for, start and stop times, Obviously, things like date of session, client's name needs to be in each um, um, note, type of session, uh, video, phone, in person, the client's name. We said client's location for telehealth. Um, you have to say where they're located. Um, topics and symptoms discussed. Uh, documentation of need for treatment. 
Okay, how is this different than a client coming in and just talking about, you know, his mother pissing him off? We really need to hear that there are symptoms being addressed. This person is uh, anxious. This person is depressed. This person is, you know, having trouble sleeping. They're having some level of distress. So always be documenting that. Uh, what were your interventions? Sometimes we don't write anything that we did in treatment on our note and watch out for check boxes. I would say at least have, you know, two or three sentences saying three things that you did in session, in that session, unique to that session that describes it. And it needs to be different each week. Um, client progress, a couple sentences on that would be fine. Or one sentence on that date of the next session, your signature and credentials, and it all needs to be legible. Now, again, I can't cover this whole topic in, in an out of network webinar, but I just wanted to really quickly, if you're not comp confident about your notes, which most of us aren't because we didn't get good training, please take my webinar uh, called What Should Be in Your Charts, Writing Great Notes. And you're going to see eight sample notes and one crummy note. And we're going to take it apart and tell you uh, all your questions, answer all your questions about working with notes and get confident. That link is on our landing page. Can you talk a little about sliding scale fees? Oh, lots of questions, pre-submitted questions about that. I hear a lot of conflicting information on the internet. Oh, surprise, surprise. Isn't internet always right? No. <laughs> all right. Let's, another big topic. Let's just go over it basically. Sometimes you see on the internet that sliding scale fees are never ethical, um, that just in the in and of themselves, they are they shouldn't be done. Um, I think that that's a bunch of hooey and the lawyers I talked to, I mean, sliding scale fees are common. Most therapists I think have a sliding scale fee and they absolutely can be ethical. Uh, the attorneys I've talked to, and I've talked to several about this said, look, you just need a clear sliding scale policy and you need to apply it fairly to everyone who walks in your door. You can't discriminate against legally protected classes. You can't say, oh, I have one sliding scale for black people and one for white people, obviously, or women and men, or um, you know, gay and straight. You can't like have different policies for different classes of, of people. So it needs to be whoever walks in your door here is your sliding scale policy and they all get it. And, and it is okay to simply base your sliding scale on a client's stated ability to pay your fee. Um, and then one attorney told me it's that they thought it was quite unwise to try to ask a client to verify their financial need. He said, first of all, you know, you ask for, let's say their tax documents. It's a lot of personal information. Um, it's, um, clients may, um, what do you call it, uh, may lie to you, um, falsify documents. So, and they're trying to come into therapy and meet you and it's already nerve wracking and you're asking them now for their tax returns. He just thinks it's very unwise. And um, also, you know, if I were going to see a therapist and somebody said, well, what is your, you know, at least just tell me what your income is. I'm not sure I, I know it. A lot of people don't know their income. Um, so it just puts them in a very weird space or, or shame space, right? If they don't know how much they make or if they do know and it's a, it's not a number they're very proud of. So uh, he said, don't ask a client to verify their financial need. Just, so I said, what do you advise? And, and he said, just tell them what your fee is. And if they say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't afford that come back with what can you afford? And so if I tell them, Hey, my fee is a, you know, 175 and they say, well, I can't possibly afford that. You say, well, what do you think you could afford? You know, then whatever they come back with, you can decide whether that's something you could slide down to or not. You either say, I'm sorry, I, I don't feel like I can slide down the low, that low, the lowest I can go would be X. Oh, and if they say, no, I can't afford that. Okay. Then you make a referral. Um, but your policy was that you are going to go through this little process with anyone who walks in your door. Um, interesting enough, I asked him, I said, I know somebody who has slots that she saves for um, unemployed people and students. 
She says those and trainees, those are her three slots. Is, is that okay? And he said, interestingly enough, those are not protected by law as, you know, under anti-discrimination laws. So you could uh, potentially save some <clears throat> sliding scale fee slots and say, the, I only slide for unemployed people, students and trainees and nobody else. As long as it's, you kind of put that out and that's your, your, uh, your policy. The bottom line is, he said, write up your your um, your sliding scale fee policy in case it's ever questioned. You can pull it out and say, here's my here's my policy. Um, the other tip he had, I said, what do you think is the biggest mistake people make when it comes to sliding scale fees? He said, <clears throat> name a time when you're going to reevaluate the need for a reduced fee, or just say, look, we're going to reevaluate this from time to time um, to see if you still need this reduced fee. Don't lock people, you know, as the client's going along in treatment and they're discussing their trip to Hawaii and, you know, they drive up in their Lexus and you're like, wait a second, you know, always let them know that we're going to reevaluate this from time to time. Okay. How do I reflect that sliding scale fee on a super bill? Ooh, okay. So the super bill needs to reflect the amount the client paid not your normal fee. I have seen people say, oh, my client's <clears throat> only paying me $70. <clears throat> my normal fee is 150, but I need to put 150 on the super bill, right? No. Super bill is like an invoice you get when you go to the grocery store and it tells how much you paid for that, you know, um, can of soup. You write that, you just need to reflect how much the soup cost. Now you can put just your sliding scale fee or just like at the supermarket, you can put the full fee minus the discount. But the bottom line is it needs to reflect, hey, this is how much the client paid. So if you put your normal fee $200, when the client paid $100, obviously this could be fraud. You're basically insurance telling the insurance plan something cost more than it did or the client paid more than they did and it could result in them getting reimbursed more than he paid. <laughs> so that would be really not good. So a simple rule to go by is as an out-of-network clinician, you got to collect whatever amount, whatever charge that you put on that super bill. If you do courtesy billing, you're going to need to balance bill the client for any portion that the plan doesn't pay. So if I put on that super bill $200 and I've only collected $100 from the client because I thought the plan was going to pay the other 100 If they don't, I need to turn around and bill the client for $100 because I represented to the insurance plan that my fee was 200 and that I was going to collect 200 for the session. That's I know that's a lot to take in. This We're going fast and there's a lot of information here, but I wanted to pack as much information as I could and answer as many questions as I could. So if you have it, questions, you can always circle back with me. It should be no problem to have two clients submitting a super bill to the same health plan with different rates for the same service. I get that question a lot. So you could have two Aetna clients one of them is paying you $70 and one's paying your full fee of $175. <clears throat> That's okay. You know, first of all, if Aetna ever called you up and say, what's the deal with this? You say, I slid my fee. Big deal. Go away, Aetna. Um, but second of all, I have never heard of an insurance plan asking that. They know. They know we slide fees and they have nothing to say about it. I have a whole webinar on, are you committing insurance fraud? If you are concerned about issues like that, um, many of us did not get good grounding in this. And the link is on our landing page at theinsurancemaze.com forward slash super bill. Can I charge private pay clients who have insurance more than those clients who don't have insurance? So can I have a two tiered system? Can I, my usual fee, let's say is $150. But if that person has insurance, can I charge them $175? Basically, if you inflate your fee for a client who has insurance and is seeking reimbursement, that could be fraud. Okay, You need to have like a full fee, a normal fee, 
and you can't go above that. You can slide below that, but you can't slide above that. Um, and I want to say this, a lot of clients, uh, therapists do give discounts to people who don't seek reimbursement. But if you base the fees on insurance coverage, it's probably not illegal, according to the lawyer I talked to, but it's probably unfair, impractical, and presumptive. Let's talk about that. So if you say are thinking to yourself, oh, this client is going to seek insurance reimbursement, so I'm going to charge them more than I would charge my other clients in my private practice. Well, it's kind of unfair because, first of all, that client, even though they're covered with insurance, might have a huge deductible, and insurance may not cover them. Uh, for a long time. Deductibles, in case you don't know, is the amount that a client has to pay out of pocket before their insurance kicks in. And some of your clients are going to have very large deductibles. They may have a separate out-of-network deductible, even separate from their in-network, one that needs to be used up before they get reimbursed. So if you end up charging them more because they happen to have an insurance card in their pocket, but if the insurance plan is not going to reimburse, it's really unfair to them. It's also impractical sometimes because people come and go with their insurance and, you know, sometimes uh, they change insurance plans and what they're, you're charging them more and now you're going to charge them less. And um, I just be careful in my private practice. I don't really want to um, charge people different for whether they have insurance or not. That wouldn't be my, my solution. I'm in network with several insurance plans. If an insurance plant client is coming to me just for relationship issues and I don't find any diagnosis more than a Z code, okay, can I see them out of network? All right, let's make sure we got this. You're in network with the insurance plan and that insurance plant client comes to see you. So you're like, oh, yay, okay. Uh, got to use insurance with this person. But then I assess them and they just have a relationship issue. Nobody is, has a diagnosis. Nobody, we don't have what we call medical necessity, which we'll talk a little more about hopefully. And can I say to them, hey, look, uh, I'd love to see you, but you don't really have the requirements for me to bill your insurance. Um, I, but you can see me of course and pay out of pocket. Yes, the answer is yes. For insurance to cover, uh, not only does that person have to have a membership card, but they also need a diagnosis more than a Z code generally. Adjustment disorder is usually okay. There's a myth out there that adjustment disorder isn't going to be covered. That's usually false. Um, you could always check that out with the health plan. But um, while you certainly can check with the health plan to see if they'll cover a Z code. You can work with this client, just tell them you can't bill their insurance, either out of network or in network, because you need that diagnosis, right? On either your super bill or in the, so <clears throat> because you need that diagnosis and inventing one would be insurance fraud. And there are big consequences for insurance fraud. A new client came, come, came to me. I'm a network provider for his insurance. I told him I have no insurance slots left. I have just too many insurance clients, but I could see him if he paid privately. He was willing to do that. Is this okay? Ooh, I get this question a lot. Unfortunately, this would be a contract violation, a violation of your contract with the insurance plan. Um, basically, you agreed when you signed up with that insurance plan that when a member came, you don't have to accept every member that comes to you, but when a member comes to you, that you will give them the benefit of being a provider for their plan and you will um, have them pay only their co-payment and you will take care of the billing. So there's certain things you agreed to for all members of that particular health plan. So while the client might agree and even sign something, it could lead to a later complaint if they get disenchanted with you, which sometimes our clients do. Um, and they could then use it against you. Uh, the only exception that you can, that I want to mention is if you are offering the use of insurance and the client says, no, I know I could use my insurance, 
but I want to waive that. I don't want to use my insurance for confidentiality reasons or for other reasons. Um, and I want to pay out of pocket, but I, I get it that you are willing to give me that, but I don't want to do it. Uh, then I would have them set, sign a self-pay agreement uh, that says, hey, I, you know, I am waiving the use of my insurance. It's of my own free will. And, uh, you know, you are offering it to me, but blah, 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 blah. Um, I have a sample self-pay agreement in my practice forms packet, which is available for purchase. And the link is on the um, landing page. So again, I'd say for the most part, no, you really can't tell a client, sorry, I have too many. I can see you privately. You either have to turn that person away and just say, sorry, I'm full, or you have to take them on and give them the benefits of their health insurance plan. What are the most common reasons an out-of-network claim might be not be paid or might be rejected? Ooh, let's go through these really quickly. Went to the deductible, we mentioned. Provider fee is more than the plan's allowed amount, so the client is getting a lower reimbursement. So maybe you charge $200 and the plan is saying that's too much, so the client's just getting less back than they expected. Maybe you were missing some kind of a code, a diagnosis, a CPT code. Maybe the provider's tax ID was unknown to the health plan, so they're waiting for your W-9. May, they may want to see your notes before payment. We mentioned that before, um, especially if you're billing for multiple sessions per week. So be sure to keep those great notes no matter who's paying. You made some kind of error or the plan made some kind of an error. The diagnosis is out of date. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about that um, and how to prevent that. Client not covered at the time of service. That's a big one. Checking coverage in advance is the best way to prevent many of these, particularly that last one. And so the other freebie I'm giving out today is an out-of-network checking coverage handout. You can give this to the clients or you can use it yourself. And it says, here, client, check. here's the questions to ask. Call your health plan and here's how to check your coverage. Because many of us are like, oh, I'll just have my clients check their coverage. They don't know what to ask. They don't know how to make sense of it. This is handout will help them and help you. If you want to get that handout, again, go to my landing page, which is highlighted in yellow. Enter your email list. Excuse me. Enter your email and uh, you'll be taken to the page with all these resources. I lose a lot of new clients when they find out I'm not in their health plan network. Any suggestions how to deal with this? Oh, I totally get this one. So I want to spend a little time on this one. You can offer to check their coverage for them. When a client calls and asks, do you take my health plan? We often say no, and then they hang up and they go away. I try to say something different. So if I really want to keep the client, I'll say, you know, why don't I check your health plan and we'll see what kind of coverage you might have to see me. So try to answer with a yes instead of a no. Uh, or at least a let's see. Um, and sometimes they're very grateful that you're willing to um, to do that for them. Um, give them the check you know, cover handout or you check it for them. Um, offer to submit claims for them. Courtesy billing light, remember, just where you're just going to submit claims for them. See if that um, is something that kind of entices them. But there's also several apps I wanted to tell you about designed to assist out-of-network clients to either make it more affordable or to speed their reimbursement. Um, and I, these aren't all of them out there, but here's a couple that I know about. Uh, Reimbursify is one that's been around the longest. Uh, these You are paid in full by the client and you can use a credit card processing that they have. And then this client submits a super bill to the plan with their phone. Like if you've ever done a mobile um, submitting your check to their bank and you just take a picture of it, um, you can do that with Reimbursify. They just take a picture of the super bill and it heads to the plan and it speeds their reimbursement. And so the client's reimbursed by the plan. You can also do it through your website. Uh, there's lots of ways that a client can quickly um, submit one of their super bills. The therapist can either pay monthly, so it's free to your clients, 
or the clients can pay $3.99 for each session that they bill that way. The convenience helps a lot of clients, especially clients who are very insurance, uh, computer savvy, that they really like just using that convenience. And they have a benefits checker with their paid plan. So there's a lot of options there. Mentaya is kind of a newer on the scene. Um, you are paid in full by the client using their credit card on the Mentaya app. And then Mentaya submits insurance claims for the client. The client is then reimbursed by the plan. Mentaya is free to therapists. There's a 5% fee per session for clients. And you and your clients can check coverage in advance. If you pay the added $29 monthly, they have a free, not a free, they have a benefits checker. You can stick on your website and clients can use it to check coverage. Thryzer is another one. Therapists go to their portal to give session information. Thryzer charges the client credit card and submits claims on behalf of the out-of-network clients. And there's different options. There's one where the client pays you in full. And there's one where the client only pays their out-of-network portion, something we were talking about before, uh, plus a 5% fee to Thryzer. And Thryzer basically um, bills the plan for the rest, and the plan pays Thryzer. So they, this one is um, Thryzer a little different in that they you can choose this other option here where the client doesn't have to pay in full. They're only paying their out-of-network portion, which can make it more affordable to your clients. Now, all of them say that they offer assistance with claim denials to varying degrees. So these are ones to check out. Um, each one of them has offered special joining discounts for, for um, people who are watching this. Um, and for folks I steer their way, it's not a kickback to me. It's a, it's a kickback for you. Uh, I'm not endorsing any one of these. Your prices may change. It's not a complete list of these type of services, but I wanted to introduce you to them. All of the links and the special, special joining discounts are going to be on our um, landing page at theinsuranceways.com forward slash superbill. All right. I think this is... Yeah. Um, what should I think about when putting a diagnosis on a super bill? A couple last things, and then we're going to take questions, I think. Um, insurance just requires that treatment to be medically needed. As we said before, addressing symptoms, not just personal growth. We usually accept adjustment disorders we mentioned. Now, be sure your code is up to date. Sometimes I'm seeing out-of-network uh, claims get kicked back because your DSM you're using claim codes that are in the DSM-5. And some of the ones in the DSM-5 are have been changed since it came out. So go to icd10data.com. Again, the link is on the landing page. And type in the code that you're about to use and look for a green triangle next to that diagnosis. If there's a red one, that means don't use it. It's old. Um, and, you know, I can... Um, you play around at that page and hopefully you'll see more about that. Just don't slap on any diagnosis. Be sure you can justify it. All right. I think we're going to make sure we have time for questions. I'm just going to leave it on this page for a minute. Uh, I think we have this. Yeah. Okay. All right. We have our first question from Mia. Can you touch on out-of-network mental health and the No Surprises Act? I know the No Surprises Act created some exceptions where an insurance negotiates with providers to pay for medically necessary health care, but I don't know if this applies to mental health at all. Sure. My understanding, basically, ugh, No Surprises Act, worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> personal opinion. Um so this No Surprises Act had a very good intention so that nobody got a surprise medical bill, but it was it was extended to private practice. You know, it was really a good idea for hospitals and certain things like that, but it was extended to private practitioners it, where it made no sense, where clients already know what they're being charged each week uh, by something like for therapy. So... My understanding is that the No Surprises Act at this point still only applies to those clients who come to see you. They do not have any, they're your private pay clients. 
and they are not going to be billing insurance at all. So they're not either not seeking insurance reimbursement. So you're not giving them. A, my mind is if you're giving them a super bill, you don't have to give them a, a good faith estimate. If you're billing insurance for them in network, you don't have to give them a good faith estimate. So it's only going to be your people with no insurance um, um, coverage um, that you're giving. An, and even though in the law, pe these people who have insurance are going to be covered at some point, at this point where we are in November um, 2023, uh, they have not figured out how to implement that. So that's on hold. So it's a very small number probably of people who this applies to. Okay, next question is from Johanna. If you are a network provider with one insurance but not others, would you be then an out-of-network provider for the other health plans? Yeah. Or if you are duly licensed and are panel in one state but not the other, can you claim yourself as an out-of-network for the state you are not paneled? Okay, great question. So the first one, definitely, if you we go back to the first slide, which is if you don't have a, a contract with that health plan, you are automatically out of network. So if I'm a network provider for Anthem, but not for Cigna and Aetna, yes, I'm out of network for Cigna and Anthem because I don't have a contract with them. So yes, you can be in network with this one, out of network with those. Now the licensing thing, it depends on the health care plan. Some plans are national and um, well, you would probably be considered on the panel in all states, even though you just got licensed. You, um, yeah. And other plans, like I would guess Blue Cross, you might need to check. So I would check with the health plan specifically to see, do you need to be in the panel for the other state where your client is located? They, some plans are going to require that you also be credentialed in that state. It's not just enough that you're licensed. Okay, next question from Elisa. When I submit claims for out-of-network insurances, I do not include a super bill. Do you have to submit a super bill with a claim every time? Well, if you are billing, um, you'd have to know how she was billing. Um, no, a super bill is an out of network claim. So you probably, if you're like going on EHR, you probably aren't submitting a super bill. You're going electronic health record. You're probably submitting a claim instead of a super bill. So no, but most people are submitting super bills if they're not and giving that to a client. Um, so that's why I'm using that. But yes, this claims would take the place of a super bill typically. Next question from Jackie. Are we allowed to charge a sliding scale for clients who have a large deductible until they meet their deductible and finally start getting reimbursements? Can we at that point charge the client our regular full fee? It's a great question. I think you're talking about out of network. Um, I would say yes, because uh, again, if we come back to, it depends what your sliding scale fee policy is. If in your sliding scale fee policy, you're saying, yeah, see, I still wouldn't base it on whether the client has a deductible, which is basing it on their insurance. I'd go back to if my policy is based on a client's ability to afford my services, some of my clients who have a sliding scale are perfectly able, or excuse me, who have a large deductible are perfectly able to afford my services during their deductible. They would just rather get, so I don't necessarily get a slide for them. Others are not able to afford my services at that, my full fee. So maybe I will slide for them. So come back to what is your policy based on? It shouldn't be, in my mind, shouldn't be based on whether a client has insurance or a deductible. It should be based on, or not should be, but come back to what you chose to base it on. And if it's affordability, then go based on that instead. Next question from Kim. If you are in network with an insurance panel, but choose to run your practice as super bill slash self pay only, can you do that? Or are we only allowed to use super bills for insurances we are out of network with? 
Right. You, if you are in network of insurance panel and a client from that insurance comes to see you, you cannot funnel them off and say, oh, no, you're going to be self-pay only. There's no way you can do that. You have promised this insurance panel. You signed a contract saying anyone who comes to you, doesn't matter how they come to you, if they have that insurance plan, you know, you will give them the benefit of the contract you signed. So, um, yes, and you can only use Super Bells for out-of-network um, panels, people who have come from places you did not sign a contract with. I think we have time for one more here, Barbara. Last one is from Dan. Can I raise my rate while giving the clients a discount so the insurance pays my new higher rate while the client's payment does not go up? Sure. I mean, uh, if you're saying, um, if you have some clients who are on sliding scale, but you want to raise your rate, sure, you can always raise your full fee, we're going to call it, your regular rate. Um, but again, if your clients, if I'm understanding it, if, if you're giving your client a soup, a, a, um, super bill and it's reflecting what they're paying, um, you're still only going to put that number on the, the, on the super bill, not this new higher rate. Um, so I'm not sure if, if your client's payment is not going up, I'm saying you're still going to be billing for the insurance plan for the same amount. So this doesn't sound kosher. Um, maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, but basically you need to be billing what the client, if it's out of network, what the client paid you. And so the reimbursement needs to be based on what they paid you, not what your actual fee is. I hope that's clear. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you for going through a ton of questions. Thank you everyone for being here today with us. Um, and definitely look out for our webinar in January. We'll be sure to communicate that with you all. Thank you so much again, Barbara. I mean, this year with webinars has been so great and we really appreciate all the help and expertise you provide. So thank you so much, Barbara. My pleasure. Bye everyone. All right, bye-bye.